All right, so this is really an oversimplification. I actually I don't remember. I have blatantly plagiarized from something off of Google Images, I'm sure. But uh, but it is definitely an oversimplification. But it's a good pictorial of all the hierarchies. And once again, the primary protein structure is just literally the amino acids in the order with which they come in the polypeptide in the protein. And there's always a directionality to it, just like the directionality for DNA and RNA. What is the directionality that you learned probably from even way back in high school biology class? Five prime to three prime, five prime to three prime, you know. And so that's just the way that it is. And did anyone ever wonder why they start with the five prime versus the three prime, you know? But they, they did. So there is also a directionality for the proteins. And so what's the directionality for the proteins? In terms of C terminus. And I do know the reason. I don't know. And the reasons why they do that for DNA five prime to three prime, but for proteins, it's because the amino end is the is the um, nucleophile that attacks the carboxyl end. Of the next one, so that's why the first the first amino acid that's added on is on the end terminus. Okay, and that's probably I mean that way too with most pieces of DNA being five prime end, but not always. Then we have the secondary structure. Secondary structure is what do the hydrogen bonding. The reason why I, one of the little caveats that I don't like about this is it just makes it sound like most hydrogen bonds, and so therefore anything and everything can form. But it's hydrogen bonding specifically with what part of the, the polypeptide? The backbone. It's not the R groups. Remember, every single, and you should know the generic structure of an amino acid, there's the, what's called the C alpha, or the ground zero carbon. It's got the carboxylic acid on the end. That's the C portion of it. And then the amino terminus, or the amino end, they all have at least one hydrogen hanging off, and then it's the R group. So the hydrogen bonding is all due to only the backbone. I guess I could have written on this, that's it's recording. The hydrogen bonding is only due to, let's see, I don't know. Let's make it a little fatter in red. Well, it didn't do it, but. Okay, so then there's the R group. So when we're talking about the secondary structure, we're talking about only the hydrogen bonds that occurs within this portion and not the R group at all. Okay. Now, the R group does have some effects on what kind of secondary structures can form, but it's not due to its bonding, it's due to its steric hindrance. The fact that we don't have free rotation around the peptide bond, but there is more rotation on the fine side bond we talked about before, where the psi bond would be this portion right here, the phi would be this portion right there. So there is rotation around those bonds, but not where the next amino acid would be at in the protein. And so because of that, the size of the R group limits some of that rotation. And so that can help dictate, put some constraints on its secondary structure, but it's not the driving force behind its secondary structure. That's only the hydrogen bonding. And then the two biggies, and I've got, I've got additional figures for it to show you. The two biggies for it that we see, and it's probably 90 plus percent of the um, secondary structure, are either the beta pleated sheets, those are called beta sheets, and alpha helices. Okay. Then what happens is we can have regions of the protein come together to form interactions three-dimensionally. And so now they can be disparate regions of the protein <clears throat> for this three-dimensional fold. So now we have amino acids that were not even near each other in that primary sequence. They're coming together to interact. And that does include interactions with the R group. Okay, so now we can talk about, we'll talk about some of the possible interactions and that we see, you know, for example, lysine and arginine and histidine usually are positively charged. So then they can form you know, ion interactions with those amino acids that are negatively charged. This is one example. Of course, you can have hydrophobic interactions. We have lots of different interactions that come together to form this tertiary protein. And so once again, all proteins have primary, secondary, tertiary, if they're considered a protein. If the peptide is so small, then it's called, considered a small peptide, then, it, they, then they may not, it gets kind of iffy on what tertiary versus secondary structure is. Because if they're so tiny, Almost all the amino acids are together. And so sometimes some of your um, 
uh, hormones, for example, uh, like oxytocin or some of these that are really small, then there's not much difference between the secondary and tertiary structure since they're really tiny. <clears throat> now, the big difference is you can have, and this is really an oversimplification, you can have more than one <coughs> protein, polypeptides, more than one strand, can be together to form an interaction. And that's why it's called quaternary. This is a simplification because they also have a quaternary interactions being, and this is really important for chemistry of cancer, I'm talking about with respect to cancer, quaternary interactions between a protein and nucleic acid whenever they form. For example, the polymerase coming to bind on the DNA or the RNA, that's a quaternary interaction because it's forming a super, superstructure. <clears throat> Like I said, balloon. these are just, and this is a little bit of a, and you can just ignore the disulfide bond for right now, but this is just an oversimplification. The primary structure, the N terminus to C terminus. So you can see they use the three letter codes, so we can even practice like GLY, what amino acid is GLY? Glycine. One of the, do you remember what's one of the special things about glycine for those who are ahead of chemistry? It is achiral. Mm -hmm. It is the only one that's completely achiral. And it's because, what is its R group? It's just a hydrogen. So it's got two hydrogens in like carbon. Remember from organic chemistry, origin chem, um, in order for a carbon to be chiral, it has to have four different things hanging off of it. And since it's got two of the same thing, it's, it's achiral. And then one other thing is, since it's a hydrogen, what's the, what else is in general, like what's, a, I mean, what else would glycine be good at? It can't hydrogen bond. The R group can't hydrogen bond. It can still hydrogen bond with the amino side and the C, C, C side, but not the, um, the R group. But what else could it be good at that? It's got much more range of movement, mm -hmm. so it's more, it's more flexible. And then I always think of it, I don't know if anyone's been to like a foreign country, maybe in New York, but I don't know my subway run. I haven't been in subway in New York, but but I've been on subways in some of the other in other countries where it's just so crowded, and I mean they're just packed in there. And then you have like the one little small person that can like wiggle through and get on through. That's like glycine. It's so tiny that it can fit in tight places, and so it's really small. This is these are examples of secondary structure. And so this is an alpha helix, and we'll talk a little bit more detail about alpha helixes and beta sheets. Technically. A beta sheet, like each one of these would be called a beta strand, but very rarely do you have a single strand. You know, you're going to have multiple strands interacting. They don't have to be, so an alpha helix all has to be in the same portion of the primary structure, right? They're in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. Here, they're not necessarily in order. You can actually have, let's see, assuming that this is the end terminus, you could have it go here, this direction, and then you can actually have a big loop and have it come all the way around and go over this right here to where beta strand one is not touching beta strand two. But in the three-dimensional structures, and they're starting, I mean, in the overall structure topology of the um, protein, they can. So that's what makes beta, that's something that's a little special about beta sheets. They, they give them parallel versus anti-parallel. So for example, this strand and this strand right here are anti-parallel with respect to each other because it's going from N to C, N to C. So if you drew overall the amino side to the C side, C terminus side, and so they're anti-parallel. And what's interesting, and sometimes people would get this confused, is a hydrogen bonding pattern between the anti-parallel are straight lines. That they're, they're called orthogonal. They're perpendicular lines to the axis of the strand. Whereas if if they are parallel, so here's N to C, N to C, the hydrogen bonding between the two are zigzagged. They are not nice perpendicular lines. That's why you can actually look at the hydrogen bond. Because it's kind of hard. I mean, this one, they, they, they were really nice where they clearly show you, oh, this is the N and this is the N. But in three-dimensional structure, it's kind of hard to tell. Right? But if you look at the hydrogen bonding pattern between them, you can tell if it's parallel or anti-parallel. Another thing that I've got pictures of in just a moment is that they're not, they're pleated and they're not perfectly flat, 
And so there's a slight, especially whenever they get really large, there's a slight torque to it. So that's why they make really good barrels and really huge structures. Okay, so this is an example of a beta sheet, and I don't have this in the PDB viewer to where we can flip it around or anything like that. <clears throat> So we can see the different strands. Let me see, I haven't double checked on this one to see if it's continuous or not. So we have, oops, let me change it. There's one, it goes up and around for two. So they're anti-parallel, three and four. So all that's anti-parallel. In fact, this entire thing is anti-parallel with respect to each the neighboring strand. And I don't remember which one this came from, which protein, but I have more examples later. These, these are alpha helices, an example of alpha helices. You're probably used to seeing that in the pictures of proteins and books and things like that anyway. There are a couple different ways of showing it. It's just, one's called the ribbon diagram, one's space filling. And the alpha helix itself has to have an in terminus side, an in side, and a C side. And because of that, they have a dipole moment overall. So they actually are slight, they give an overall kind of slight dipole Think back to Gen Kim. And the reason, and I like the space filling. So they're showing you, of course, this is the oxygen for each of the carboxylic acids, the acyl portion of the carboxylic acid. And this is the amino group. Okay, so when you turn it on its end and you're looking at the end, you can see all of the oxygens are pointing up. So therefore, all the nitrogens are pointing down. So I'm just going to draw one of these. so on and so forth but so because of that I said I was going to draw one but I had to draw more than one to get it to work but because of this we can see that you know the carbon is delta plus this is delta minus then this is going to have you know the nitrogen be, can be positively charged with delta plus delta minus so all the delta pluses would be on the bottom from where I have it drawn all the delta minuses would be at the top so therefore we have an overall, it was not very straight, overall dipole moment where this would be the slightly more positive end and then the top of that one would be slightly more negative. <clears throat> one thing that's not evident on here because they, they're showing just glycine, um, but the R groups all stick down and out, kind of like a Christmas tree. All right, so this is an example of tertiary structure. This is the beta-1 domain for streptococcal protein G, which if you took immunology, you may have talked about this one. I don't know what how much detail you guys went into. Does anyone know what streptococcal protein G does? It's, don't confuse it with the G protein for biochemistry. For those who had biochemistry next hour, it's, a, it's different. They like Gs. No, this is, and this is only one domain. So the proteins can be so large and complex that they have domains. They're also called motifs. And this is one of the domains. This is called an alpha beta domain of, um, or alpha beta structure or motif, because this is one of the domains that recognizes IgG. Okay, right? And it also binds to one other protein, recognizes one other protein in your body called the serum albumin. And so it's, and I don't know what it does from there on, if it's necessary for streptococcal infections or not. But this is just one portion of it that binds IgG. <clears throat> and so here, one of the reasons why I like it is we have a beta sheet where these two are anti-parallel with respect to each other. These two are parallel. And if we follow the protein, so this is the would be the in terminus side of the domain. We have this strand, so that's first, second, so it's anti-parallel, but if you notice it loops around to do the alpha helix, comes back to the far side, and then this would be the C terminus. So it kind of shows like in three-dimensional structures can be much much more complicated than what some of those old pictures can, can show. <clears throat> and you can have couple different types of loops. 
we can just have a simple loop here between strands, or you can actually use an alpha helix to go between beta strands as well. And remember, these aren't the only two types of secondary structures, and I guess technically a loop in them itself is kind of a secondary structure sometimes, but um, they're, it's the most, they're, they're, they're the two most common. There, there are some special helices that are used. Uh, helices are also handed. They can either be, most of them are gonna be right-handed, but there's right-handed and left-handed based off of the way that the, they curve. Uh, but you can also have one called the 310 helix, which is really skinny, and there are also different types of secondary structures. Okay. I wanted to talk more detail with hemagglutinin. And it doesn't have anything to do with cancer, but it's to show the complexity of protein structures and also the kind of function that it can do. Which is, I mean, this is amazing. Does anyone know what is hemagglutinin? What is it, a protein in? Mm, nope, but it, I mean, it, it, it sounds, because it's named off of, because you know, the, the name derives from that, but the name is kind of a misnomer. Does anyone know what, it's an organism, kind of, that has it. Because technically speaking, the organism's not alive. That's why I say organism with little air quotes. It's, yes, it's, it's um, influenza, as hemoglobin. So when you hear like H1N1, the H, is the version of hemagglutinin, like what H, whatever that number is, there are multiple isoforms for it. And so hemagglutinin, this is the quaternary structure, but first of all, I want to point out that, that for whatever paper that I took this from, or you actually got it from Google Images once again, but they, they used two different ways. They did a space filling and they did the ribbon diagram. Here's a complete ribbon diagram, but it's alpha and beta helical. <laughs> That it's alpha helical and beta sheet. And so I'll say right. <clears throat> but it's involved in the way that the influenza actually infects a cell and goes, is transferred from one cell to the next cell. And so you can look at, this is a single peptide on this side, on the left-hand side. We have a, well, it's got a little piece of one, but you can see it's really uh, long. Okay, long portion, and then we have multiple strands. I think this one's a trimer, if I remember right, that comes together and forms the big overall complex for hemagglutinin. So that'd be the quaternary structure. Yeah. The tertiary structure would be a single strand, but then we have the three of them come together for the quaternary strand. One of the reasons why I like to talk about this one too is the fact that the way that infects is pH dependent, and hemagglutinin. I used to know the exact number, but from back with the Duke, but hemagglutinin has a hinge on one end, and as a function of pH, it swings out and goes, and we're talking like 120 angstrom, something like that, some huge movements, like a huge arm that comes out to grab on to the next membrane, and then as the pH changes, it brings them together, and it uses those membranes together, and that's how influenza, it's one of the ways, the main way the influenza actually infects from one cell or from one, technically speaking, I think is a lot of it also happens from once it gets infused from the vesicle to the whatever membrane that needs in order to be released. And so this is just a little cartoon to show this. It's color coded and then what they've done is they, they took some of the colors away to simplify it. It re typically recognizes glycoproteins on the whatever cell it's wanting to infect. It has an anchor here. You can see it's cloistered, and then as pH changes, these kind of give way, and the part that was way down here then flips out, what is that red color, comes in, and it, it actually interacts and infects, or not, intersects the membrane, and then they zip up together to bring them in close contact, and then eventually the two will fuse together. But you can see that there are huge movements. Proteins aren't necessarily just always really tiny. When we talk about hemog hemoglobin and biochemistry, we talk about you know just oxygen binding or not binding. Those are relatively small movements, but some of these proteins are really big. What they do. <clears throat> All right. Just last little bit. We just want to start talking about what causes the protein. Because we've talked about proteins folding, and which is really important. They've got to fold correctly because you don't want them to be too active, but you also want them to be active enough. So they shouldn't be. Dead, because bad things can happen. 
when proteins misfold. What's one of the examples of something that happens that's bad when proteins misfold? Mad cow, like the prions. Those are misfolded proteins. Yeah. All the spongiforms, mad cow, Alzheimer's, even uh, amyloid protein plaque formations for arteries and things like that can happen. So those would be the misfolded proteins. <clears throat> Let me make sure that we're looking at these. All right. So now we have to start thinking about ways that what are some of the interactions that can happen? What's one interaction within, between the amino acids or the polypeptides or whatever that can help cause a protein to fold? What's something that's going to help cause it to fold? The ch charges. Mm -hmm. Things that are positively charged, you know, interacting with things that are negatively charged. They give it a really technical term. They call them electrostatic interactions, just in case you come across any of the papers that you're reading. Or some of the old terms for it, it's called a salt bridge. Since you don't think sodium chloride, because you have to have a cation and an anion mix of salt. So sometimes they'll read papers or they'll talk about, oh, there's a salt bridge that happens, which makes a sound. I don't know. So, principle or something like that. I don't know what. Yeah, it's a salt bridge or an electrostatic interaction. So, just an example of that, which we mentioned earlier, is we can have lysine, because what's the charge usually on a lysine? Positive. Positive, and it can interact with what's one that's usually or many times negatively charged? Glutamate. Glutamate. Mm -hmm. okay. And the one letter code is K. And does anyone remember what's the one letter code for glutamate? E. e. The glutamine is cute. It's a little, the glutamine and glutamate are the ones that are really hard. I, I always remember the thing like glue for glutamate, it spells glue, G L U E. Yeah, they don't, it doesn't follow. The, the, I always thought that that was probably the more, most difficult ones to memorize, to remember. <clears throat> Someone also mentioned, similar to charges, is polarity. So we have polar interactions. Was it, whoops, I can't. I'm having some problems writing now. But polar interactions can occur. And so does anything that's delta plus with a delta minus, lots Lots and lots of amino acids have, you know, varying degrees of polarity. So now one example would be glutamine, you know, which has an amide. And then what's, let's see, that's another one. Oh, maybe something like, what's another polar amino acid? Serine. Serine. And glutamine is Q, and serine is S. S. <clears throat> what else could there be? Hydrophobic There's hydrophobic. Because mm -hmm. hydrophilic is really another thing, way of thinking about it, polar. So there's hydrophobic. Interactions. And so what are hydrophobic interactions? Like, what, what do they try to do or not do? Right, they're going to help fold the interior of the protein to exclude water. Okay. Now, there's, there are times that you see hydrophobic patches or some regions on the outside of the protein. What's one, what's one of the big ones, especially if you involved for cancer? What's one of the regions, I mean, not just cancer, but for just cells in general? Where... Where in the cell would you have hydrophobic regions on the outside of the protein as well? The membrane. The membrane. Okay, if it's something stuck inside the membrane there, then you're going to have it, since it's a hydrophobic membrane, you're going to have hydrophobic regions on that side. Or sometimes you even have two proteins. I, I don't know about hemagglutinin in, in particular, but some of the proteins, when they come together in their quaternary structure, the way that they sometimes interact with each other is through hydrophobic interactions too. If they have an outside portion that's hydrophobic, then the two hydrophobic regions will come together.
<clears throat> okay. Uh, we talked about, this is actually related to number one, but it's another type, it's electrostatic repulsion. We talked about it whenever it's, so technically I guess you could even put it in there, but electrostatic re repulsion. So if you have things that are positively charged, both of them positively charged, or both of them negatively charged near each other, then they're going to want to repel each other. And that can actually help with protein folding as well. <clears throat> or if a mute, certain mutation occurs, where you know you had that lysine in the first part was all of a sudden mutated to, you know, aspartate, then that you lost that interaction and they could repel each other, and therefore you know something possibly bad could happen. Once in a while, something possibly good. You can't have gain of function mutations. Would resonance contribute to protein folding at all? Well, I mean, for resonance, no, I mean, we take the resonance structure into account when we're talking about the peptide bond itself of the backbone. Okay, so not so much for the three-dimensional here. With one exception being um, aromatic. You know, the aromatic, there's a special type of aromatic bond that would be relatively m minor, but that there, there are only certain ways that aromatic interactions can occur. And so those, and those are types of resonance. Which we can also think about, um, what's another thing that helps dictate, and actually I didn't even have it on the thing that I'm looking off of, it's similar to the aromatics, and along the whole idea of electrostatic repulsion, what else is there that's going to help dictate protein structure? Size. Pardon? Size. Size, right? So that's steric interactions. You have things that are big and bulky next to each other, they're going to just push each other away. Or if you put in a glycine for something that had been big, you freed up a lot more room, so now there's more flexibility there. <clears throat> and then, let's see, that's another possibility. Only one amino acid can do this one. Is it proline? Well, proline does. Proline is actually due to steric, it was steric hindrance in a sense, because proline is the one where it doesn't have a free R group. It doubles back on itself. Okay, but there's, that always freaks me out when I see like him driving with the trees and stuff. <laughs> Makes me feel like I'm moving. All right. Uh, but there's one amino acid here that can be, if I give away, if I said what the amino acid was, it would give it away. They form a specific type of structural interaction. So they have a sulfur. Cysteine. Cysteine with sulfide binding, disulfide formations. So disulfide bonds of cysteine, which sometimes it's very no. bonds. So those are cysteine. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Pardon? Methionine can only do it if it loses that last methyl group. Which then it's no longer called methionine, it's called homocysteine. Which your the body doesn't put those normally into proteins, but homocysteine is hugely important for other metabolic pathways. Which those of you currently in biochemistry too, we haven't gotten to yet. And so your body requires it for methylation reactions and methyl transferases and things that use methionine and homocysteine. But when the pro and, and homocysteine even has its own three letter code, HCY. However, Homocysteine, whenever it gets too high or too low, but especially if it gets too high, is indicative that it causes heart problems. And so it's actually one of the major indicators of heart disease. Is, is it gets out of whack, the metabolic pathway gets out of whack, and so therefore your homocysteine levels come up, and so you can have either homocysteinemia or homocysteinuria, things like that, that comes out in your urine or your blood. <clears throat> but then it's, it's methionine, and it just has, it's lost that. In fact, that's actually usually the way that I remember what methionine looks like. Otherwise, I forget how many 
carbons and stuff, is it looks just like cysteine, but it has an extra linking carbon, and then no methyl group on the end. Okay, that's just the same thing that we just said. And so I like, I really like this little picture because it shows you a little cartoon way of different parts of structures and things. It's not all inclusive, like they didn't put, you know, um, steric hindrance so much and the things that would be negatively affecting it, I should say, they put the positive ones. And they also included some. I mean, first of all, we just have the hydrogen bonding due to the secondary structure. But here's one that often gets overlooked, and this is really important. And once we start talking about things that have to do with cancer, it's really important. So not only your protein, with protein, so what else, I mean, what's the other major biomolecule that's involved in cancer? We have proteins, of course. I mean, bio, bio, I'm just saying, I mean, broad spectrum. What is, what is cancer once again? Unregulated cell, cell growth. And it can be one of the major reasons why it's unregulated cell growth is because we have an increase in. Like the like transcription and translation. Yeah. So, and so all the RNAs and DNAs and stuff, those are negatively charged. They have metal ions all over the place. So that's why metal ion interactions are really important. And so, but, and those can be calcium. What's another one that's a major, major player? Magnesium. magnesium. In fact, for biochemistry standard conditions, we include magnesium, whereas they don't in organic and biochemistry. I mean, organic and gene chem. And so magnesium, calcium, what are some of the other ones that are important? Manganese, cobalt, uh, zinc. Zinc is huge, especially for structure. And one of the reasons why, unfortunately, we don't get to talk about that too much in we're going to run out of time for gen chem is zinc, unlike a lot of the other ones that are in the transition metals, is it has a set structure. It does not vary. And so it's structurally, it's, it's great. It's always tetrahedral. Well, it binds things to tetrahedral. Some of them have multiple formations. So, and zinc can also modify water molecules to make them more nucleophilic. And so zinc is used a lot. Some of the ones that we, oh, iron, copper. All right, then we have the hydrophobic interactions. So this is hydrophobic. Then we have the disulfide bond here. We have different types of hydrogen bonding, electrostatic, salt bridges, things like that. And like I said, plus we can have things that can negatively affect it if things are too bulky or if you have things that are the same charge next to each other. Then that would actually help dictate the folding. Okay. What is the number one driving force for protein folding initially? hydrophobic. The moment it comes out of that ribosome, so we have our ribosome. Don't hate me because it's beautiful. Um, but we have a ribosome. And we've got the, you know, it's called a nascent chain, which literally means being birthed, the newly birthed protein that's coming out. But there are going to be hydrophobic regions, and the cellular environment is hydrophilic. I mean, we're water-based. And not only that, but the concentration, and you've seen pictures from you know, histology or cell and molecular or genetics or whatever, where the ER, you know, the ER where the ribosomes are, I mean, it looks like little pearls, like little dots, because there are so many ribosomes all over the place. You can imagine they're all shooting out those proteins to keep up with cellular metabolism. So because of that, the concentration of proteins and charges and everything there are really high. And so they have to be able to collapse almost immediately. They have to, and we're talking like femtoseconds probably that they're collapsing, and or otherwise they're gonna get stuck to each other and it's gonna be a big mess. And so then there are, and I actually do have, because I put in the slides from biochemistry in here as well, just for you, for those who haven't had biochemistry, it's the same type of things, it just gives more pictures. If I can see some of them that are in it.
They're called chaperones. And I think it's also, sometimes also called chaperonin. I think it's derived from German. And what that happens is these are big protein complexes that come along as the proteins are being made, or sometimes they get activated whenever proteins start to misfold naturally. And what they do is they bind it, and they kind of look like, um, to me, it kind of looks like the kind of trash cans that have the lid where you can step on it, the lid opens, the protein chain can go in there, it closes, and it creates like a little cloistered environment for it to fold correctly, or to help it fold correctly. Or, of course, I went to a secular school, and so the way that the high chemistry professor told us, as he said, it looked like a jigger to where, you know, they put the drink would be in there, you put the lid on it, and he's like, you shut up. But, so to speak. Whatever way it fails to memorize, you what it looks like. One of the very first one, and a lot of times these chaperones will even start off with HSP, so they're called heat shock proteins, and I would still buy a chemistry this, because it's kind of cruel the way that they were discovered, is what they would do is they would literally would take bacteria or yeast, and they would put them and they heat them up to just as they were dying. They would literally get these little organisms to where they were dying, and they'd look, okay, what proteins get turned on, and why? And so they found out all these proteins, and the reason why is because as you know, your body, or as proteins heat up normally, they start to fall apart, you're interrupting those interactions. So our body, or all organisms, produce these, these chaperonins to try to save that for as long as possible. And so then they, what they did is they took the same yeast and the bacteria, and they put them at really cold temperatures where they were dying, and they saw, oh, there are proteins that get turned on there, so they call them cold shock proteins. Couldn't find out they're all the same family, right? They're all chaperonins, but some of them, so you don't see CSPs, and whenever I first started, they used to talk about oh, this is cold shock protein versus heat shock. In reality, they're all chaperonins, and um, the HSP has kind of stuck around since it was the very first one that was discovered, and 70 was the size. Okay, so they're like, oh, we have something 70 kilodaltons, and it, it's upregulated whenever you, you know, slowly start to boil the yeast. So, but everybody has chaperones, and um, this is what they look like. Oops. So that's why I kind of say how it gets cut off because of the recording thing. But it, it, they're very, very large complexes, and this is from E. coli. So there's called that. We brought seeing it's from EL and Rho ES, so like the big major complexes. But the little protein chain gets stuck in there. It requires AT. A, a, a hydrolysis of ATP for energy, which puts the lid on it, the lid, that way it can fold correctly and then it gets released. And then it gets recycled for it to happen over and over and over and over again. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Can that help uh, misfolded proteins fold correctly? Or is it only proteins that are folded yet? No, it's also for misfolded proteins. And so that's one of the reasons why, um, whenever for the heat shock, Whenever you start to, it's not so much that whenever you start to heat something up that the proteins just get be more frequently, it's also the fact that they start to misfold, they start to fall apart and misfold. And so then they, this, is, this is almost like a last ditch effort as well to try to save whatever it is. Okay. And sometimes it also help mark things for death. You know, if, if it's beyond help, it's going to say, okay, we're going to need a proteasome, the proteases come in, we chew this up, we'll try to salvage what we can out of the amino acids or the energy from it. And they prevent you know um, further catastrophes from occurring. Yep. So the row ES is coming off and then just kind of popping on top. Mm -hmm. like yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like the lid. When you think of it. Yes. Does any work from what you've heard been done with these and like prime disease? I know that they've looked at things like this with prion diseases. It's that they when they misfold their interactions are so tight, usually, because they're small, almost all the prions are really, really tiny, and that, I mean, these cannot, that's why, that's why they can't heat them up without, I mean, it's just, that's why even cooking hamburger that has mad cow disease doesn't destroy it. So it's not like, you know, an E. coli infection or something where maybe you can get a toxic shock protein or something like that from the end of the food, whatever, but you can't, Prions, because you can't even heat them up to, to destroy them. Because they are so so stable as an unfolded, misfolded protein. And so that's why they're there. there. Uh, yep. 
Well, okay, I want to remind you, we won't be meeting on Friday, because I don't, it should be back from the doctor's appointment, just in case I won't, so you can be working on your, your um, paper and going over printing structures and things uh, from Monday's class. And then next week, we'll be doing more the printing, we'll be going over the, your papers and your assignments and that, and I'll also give out what the next major topic is, because we're not going to go over this. I can't, I have to look to see if I want to do epigenetics or if I want to do DNA, you know, uh, nucleic acid repair first, but um, to see which ones I think are easier to go over first. So I'm going to go ahead and in class in prayer. Dear Holy Father, I want to praise you and thank you for this wonderful day. The beautiful sunshine outside, Lord, and the fact that you are God on the throne and that you are Lord of all. And just ask that you guide us and direct us, keep your hand over us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs>